So I'm here today with uh, Robert Frenet from Miramichi, New Brunswick. How's it going, Robert? I'm very well. D despite Trump getting in today and knowing that he's the president-elect, I'm still choosing, uh, you know, my my positive side and that there'll just be more healing coming about from all of these, sad, all, all the very sad, the, the, the big sadness and injustice of the this gentleman being reelected. And I think all we can do is just bless the people and hope that, uh, you know, it's still the best outcome for all over this next couple of years of what's going to be happening in America. Absolutely. And, you know, as a social justice advocate and uh, anybody who knows me, I'm tra I was trained in a real you know, uh, critical school of thought, post-colonial school of thought, uh, and as a queer identified man is... Um, one of the things I said in 2016, and I continue to say, is people don't reflect enough on their natural, racist, xenophobic, homophobic, you know, we other in the world, right? We have an ego and we like to other. And one thing that Trump has been a blessing is that sometime with our egos, we think that we've gotten further as a society than we did. And he gave voice to realizing that we still have a lot of work to do in healing and coming together and that there's still a lot of othering. And for me, uh, being a clinician, being a spiritual seeker, is it's about really celebrating diversity and realizing, ironically, simultaneously, um, that we're all human. Right. And we all have an ego and we're all and we all have a spirit, you know, from my spiritual standpoint. And uh, one of the things I tried to remember this morning is uh, my husband said, oh, my God, Robert, you were right. Trump got in. And I said, in this world of illusion, uh, you know, on some level, does not matter? And then the critical, you know, social justice advocate is like, of course it does. But uh, anyway, hopefully it will just uh, stir more movement from the other side. And, uh, you know, we can even send Trump the best that he comes up with some a better ideas maybe is a little more self-reflexive in this term rather than he rather than how he acted last and that's right and you know we can only look forward with positive thoughts on the future as things are what they are um but i think i loved what you said about diversity because i see it as too as color like life has so much color and often we live where things have to be black and white but there's yes. so many shades that we see and the most beautiful yeah. things in life are just full of that color. Absolutely. And if we're not going to call any color bad or good. It's just simply part of what is. Absolutely. Uh, and then we have to look at what's our perception of what's going on, you know. Absolutely. And how we One deal. One of the with things it. that came through to me today, you know, when we're talking about change and talking about habits is um, it really stood out to me today in doing some grief work about Trump getting in with a uh, a fellow, you know, social justice uh, advocate kind of client, is that it really helps us to remind us to go in to go, what do I want this world to look like? And how do I want to make a difference? We so often go like, how are we treated by people? And, you know, sometimes I'll remind clients, and you know, always honor the grief, but say, okay, so the way you were treated would you rather be treated like that or treat others like that? And again and again, people say, right, I can't control how other people act, but I can either be changed by them negatively and act the same toward others, or do I want to participate in making it a better world? So be the change that we want to see, Absolutely. right? And that old phrase, like, you know, sometimes I'm working with the kids, but if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and look back at me. So, so Robert, first, uh, just tell people a little bit about yourself. I didn't, we didn't do an intro here. So yeah, sure. who are you? You, where do you work? <laughs> so I have a private practice uh, here in Miramichi. I'm, um, you know what? It's funny when you wrote on your Facebook wall, social worker, Joe and I have been having this conversation a lot. I thought, wow, so many people don't know I'm a social worker. So many people think social workers are uh, child protection workers and have no idea that most of the clinicians that they're seeing are so often social workers, right? So I thought it was interesting. And, and it's funny, my husband is going to be uh, doing a little advertisement or advertisement with NBASW, our association, 
uh, because he had written into them and said, you know, we have a lot of friends and colleagues who are child protection workers, but we have friends who are clinicians. I have a husband who's a clinician. You know, we work in hospitals, we work in communities. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of being a clinician whose foundation is social work. And, uh, you know, I have my BA in psychology and sociology from St. Thomas, uh, but I have a bachelor's in social work from Dalhousie University. And I have a master's uh, in social work from Dalhousie University as well. Studied narrative in all three degrees. So I am a narrative therapist. And I find that really exciting because looking at people's habits, um, people, you know, wanting to change things when they come in is, ah, oh, we start with the story, right? We remove the shame, the guilt. People have a lot of narratives of, you know, I just don't have the discipline or I don't seem to have the commitment. And I go, oh, that's bull. That's bull. Is Let's look at the story. There's always a story. Something is happening. What's arresting you from these new habits? Uh, and when we change the story, you'll probably organically, without shame, move into the healthier, right? Making some better choices and kind of moving into some of the behaviors that help us make those changes. Well, I know for me, Robert, like I could have written narrative therapist and people would need some explanation. But yeah. when you describe that's what you do, and this is the thing when you see a, a counselor, a psychologist, a therapist, you know, yeah. and, and I really get people to look for someone that they really have a good match with, right? But, yes. but also there's so many different styles of therapy. But really when, as a narrative therapist, it's about telling the story. So for me, it's like, I get the chance then mm -hmm. to rewrite my story or write another story. Story. I'm so and get rid of an old story. Like as a narrative therapist, we are anybody who knows me, I'm very animated and I'm very excited about my work. And I think that's what keeps me so young is people come in. And when you say your actual, this story isn't a fact necessarily, is it real? And has it had an impact? Absolutely. But if there's parts of the story no longer work. So when you we're talking about forming new habits, as I say to people, it's kind of like a cognitive behavioral therapist, just kind of the, the 2.0 version, right? The post-structural version is like, if that story doesn't work anymore and we change the story, you'll often see a change in behavior, right? Because that's just not the story anymore. So it's really exciting work. So I guess that's where we start with how I see uh, you know, new habits and and changes. And I have to say the other part that I married, started marrying with narrative therapy um, about 10 years ago when I had my own burnout, and you and I have talked about that before in our former, you know, during COVID, some of our uh, some of our talks is um some of Tara Brock's work on radical self-compassion is the habits that I have changed and formed in the last 10 years that I have sustained and never had been able to before came about from removing the shame and guilt that had really motivated me for years to make change, but I could never stay with it. Utilizing some of Tara Brock's work on radical self-compassion is I compassionately changed stories and compassionately moved into making changes. And I was just saying to um, a friend the other night that I have been consistently at the gym for working out consistently five days a week for nine years and seven years at the gym. And, you know, I had been very overweight for many years and I just gently started slowly making some small changes, you know, kind of one step at a time, moving away from the dieting mentality. And we don't realize so often this dieting mentality kind of invades everything, right? All or nothing. Oh, I had a cookie. So now I am fell off the wagon. I'm like, when I started realizing a cookie didn't make me way over 300 pounds is when I had a cookie and thought I fell off this wagon and would have a box of them right? So kind of moderation. And uh, that's one of the things to me that I see as a clinician, when people make change and make it in baby steps, they really entrench it, they go to the root of it, is I, I see years later, people still being able to keep up with those changes. And that's it, because the, the biggest thing with the, the giant leaps is like you said, you can't sustain it. And it's like, you know, if we talk about weight loss, for example, the biggest loser is just such the greatest example because, you know, those people on TV and 300 pounds later, yeah. and then when they examine them a year or two in the future, they've kind of gone back there again because Absolutely. the body wasn't ready. And again, they only, they wanted something really quick fix. And I think a lot of times too, when people start to make a habit change, they want it to happen overnight. 
Absolutely. and they want it to stick. But we need time. We need the neural pathways, right? Like change doesn't happen overnight. We have to rewrite the story and then yes. we have to play that record because we have to rewind. We, and create, we really do, right? We're reconstructing. You and I have talked about it before is narrative therapy is science. It's post-structural science because it does, we, sh we see when people entrench these new stories, we see how the brain, right, really rewires itself. And does that take some work? Absolutely, because we have those worn down old pathways. But it's amazing. And I start to see with narrative change, the change in the nervous system, right? That parasympathetic, sympathetic movement gets changed, right? I see it with doing exposure therapy with changing story and working with the somatic. Like there's so many pieces that I literally, people believe these you know, certain parts of the pain body or pain that they've had for years actually process trauma and change stories and actually see an alleviation that I know, you know, you and I have had many critical conversations is that sometime we don't have the machinery yet to measure this in allopathic medicine, but we know, we know there's changes, right? You know, Dr. Gabor Mate is one of the people who's been talking about it for years and you and I have been talking about it for years is from you know the gut health, the brain health, the what we're putting in our bodies is pain can be managed in a whole new way by changing habits and changing stories. And that's it. And bringing that awareness because I think people often get stuck in the pattern. And you know, as I see patients now in my office, they're like, "Well, I've always done it that way, and that's how I always was." But when you say you can change. Things can change. There's hope and healing for everything, right? Absolutely. And I think, especially in my Western, the philosophy, you know, I have so many patients that come in and, you know, the doctor told me mm -hmm. that I'm going to have this arthritis for the rest of my life. So it's really a defeatist. That's action. a story. Yeah. And then that programming comes in. And so when I offer, well, do you think it's possible? Because this one individual was already starting to feel better and because she started eating better and making some That's better choices. And I'm like, that just because he said that doesn't mean that this condition is going to be there. So Absolutely. it can be it can be our story, Robert, but it's the story put on us as well. And you know, we're changing that is that's as an anti-oppressive clinician, is I remind people my story does not have to trump yours. I could be mistaken. That's why people know who work with me, is I always say, Does that resonate? And people say, Robert, why do you say that? And I say, Because if your gut tells you differently, trust your gut more than you trust me. Right. It has to resonate. And that's an important piece. Wow. OK, so this is so habit formation. So starting with the little steps, going to yes. anchor it in, creates those pathways. What are some other things that you have worked for you in terms of on your pathway of change? One of the pieces I'd have to say with using mindfulness is really before I try to make it different is sitting with what it is. What informs it being like it is past some of the constructs, the stories, the mindlessness around it, just assuming that I'm supposed to be thinner or I'm supposed to be so, you know, we get all this gung ho about change, but I see with doing trauma work is we have to build a container that stress tolerance of so how did I get here? So the mindfulness of just sitting, first of all, in what appears to be the antithesis or the opposite of where we want to be, often helps us ironically move into a different space. I always tell people when I had a 52 inch waist, I can honestly say just before I started getting in shape about a decade ago, is what was most ironic is I fell in love with the guy with the 52 inch waist. He, I did not move into wellness with having photos up that were shaming me or going, oh my God, I actually started it. And I always say, this is where manifestation comes in is I was like, wow, I'm beautiful as a big man, but I'm so lean and I'm so healthy. And I remember for years just saying like, I am so lean and so healthy. And suddenly one day I wasn't a 52 inch waist. I was a 36, right? And that wasn't over a couple of months. That was over a couple of years, right? It had been gradual. It had been real. It was suddenly I noticed I don't need that extra Pepsi, right? I didn't give it all up at once. I'm like, maybe I shouldn't have sugar during the week, right? It was so gradual, but it actually started ironically in the place 
of being able to sit in the space that was uncomfortable before I ironically could move out of that space. And that's what mindfulness has taught me. Robert, this is so wonderful because, you know, many times I see in our driven society, you know, it's all about doing the next thing and what can I do next? It's whether it's, you know, learning to meditate or going to the gym or taking up a new hobby. And often what we do is we throw ourselves in yeah. and we still didn't take that time to pause and no. say, why do I think I need that? It, 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 do I really need that? Or did I see some influencer talking about these things? You know, Dr. Keenan spoke about all this, so I have to do all these habits now. But no, yes. I love that you said that. Sit still with yourself and just look and just start to ask, what's really going on here? What's yeah. really driving me at this moment to yes. want to change anything? And, you know, just with that is most people will come back to me and say, I found a few more stories in there right? Some of them work, some of them don't. And I think that's the part that I find with analysis is so helpful. Narrative analysis is just kind of conversational. You know, we're just unpacking, moving back and forth in that conversation. Just kind of that, I think, old tool that's not always used enough, but that comes from psychoanalysis is just kind of like, and you know, you'll hear it lots in the last few years, but really unpacking as cliche as it sounds, it's like digging through, right? And I think sometimes we have to realize that digging through, we often will touch live wires that are some of those old wounds. And I always say to people is the more people realize that I have to lean into those is that's where that pain is, is where the healing is as well. Right. It's so true. It's in the leaning in it's hard. You know, I've oh, so hard. <laughs> we, we've all been there. Right. Yep. And and we think we have it figured out. And that's like, oh, yeah, that too, right? But knowing it's that, you know, the Japanese, the crack pot that they have. Yes. You know, that the cracks are where the light comes in. Isn't that beautiful? So we don't need to be afraid of that. And we don't need to push it because, you know, whatever we, whatever we resist is going to persist. Absolutely. And it's and so true, right? That flowing. And I always say, it's really funny. Uh, just this week, uh, I was... Uh, Last week was diagnosed with, uh, I was very fortunate. I'm in my 50s and I am a big man. Uh, it was, I was only diagnosed with mild obstructive apnea, but uh, I started on a machine last week and I love it. And my husband's like, and, and even I was speaking with the respiratory therapist yesterday and she's like, you know, some people only can have it on a few hours. And, so, and I wanted to tell her and I didn't get to talk to her in person yet. It's like my mindfulness was like oh, this beautiful misty air is coming in and opening everything up. So I'm doing this deep. I feel like I'm meditating all night. I wake up in the night and if it slides off at all, I'm just like, this is beautiful. Like, I mean, mindfulness has changed. Like most people tell me, oh, my God, wait till you have to get this machine and you feel like you're Darth Vader and. I'm like, mindfulness changed my experience, like this beautiful air. My husband is sleeping better than he has in years because he doesn't have to poke me to roll over. I'm lying on my back again, which I hadn't been able to do in years. And so I'm just like, wow, like when she said, this is a habit that you'll have to build, ironically, just my attitude is she's like, you kept it on all night, each night since. And I'm like, yes, absolutely. It's beautiful. I'm not snoring. It's wonderful. I think I'm going to use this clip for my next patients that come in that need the device. It's because wonderful. again, it's all how we frame these stories in our lives. We have, we always have, you know, and that's what mindfulness taught me too, is to take that moment of pause to like literally to reflect, I have a choice right now. I can choose to do this or to do that. I can choose Absolutely. to be upset that I had this device, or I can choose to say, this is going to add to my life. I'm going to sleep better, my immune function and everything else. Absolutely. Is going and and it's so cool already, uh, Dr. Kanan, is that I can feel the difference. Like this is what five after five, we've had the time change. I have been tired for three years, no matter my nutrition, I get my blood work done. And when I talk to Dr. Arson about it and, you know, just realizing it's like, well, if you're not sleeping, uh, my numbers were quite mild. And I said, how can that be mild? 13 times an hour, my air was obstructed. And that's mild. And I'm like, that's not mild. And she's like, yes, believe it or not, it is. And so can you imagine how exciting it is that I'm not putting that pressure on my pulmonary system, on my heart, 
you know, uh, there's uh, a hard history in my family. I'm like, wow, I told Joe, like, with this and a few other changes, I might live till I'm 100, like some of my relatives have. And your energy levels too, like you said. Oh, like already. Like I was, I, I started saying I, I have a little ADHD, so I go on to something else, but I'm not tired and it's five after five and I haven't been tired today. <laughs> right? That's pretty good incredible just that again when we look at our body listening to these changes and saying something's not right here yes. and that now i have a device that can assist my body absolutely. and to help help you love your body just a little bit more absolutely <laughs> I, it, I it's really interesting as i make all these noise and i because the pressure that they just readjusted to is if i open my mouth i sound like some kind of i kind of sound like darth vader breathing but so i'm just having a little bit of fun my husband is learning that because he loves to talk once the lights are out, that I cannot communicate with this machine on my nose because I sound like Daffy Duck. <laughs> it's really funny. Oh, that's amazing. Yes, um, people need to know this, that a sleep apnea breathing device can add to your life. It really um, can. And is there any then, so as we get ready to wrap up, is there a third thing or something else that you just want to share that really has helped you push... Um, push yourself over the edge, like in the positive way of moving yeah. forward or what works for patients that you've seen? One of mine is, uh, it's interesting, is really looking at action over thought is that I've learned in mindfulness that unless something kind of is revealed to me or seems like, because I've ruminated for many years is I have crappy thinking all the time. That's how an ego works. I still jump into the action. Right. So like my I go to the gym four or five nights a week. I used to do six. Make sure I get four. Three is not enough. Five is my bonus. And it's interesting is uh, I noticed about a year and a half ago is uh, there was a lot of stories like, oh, I'm tired tonight, so I can't go. I I go every time when my ego starts to speak in a way that doesn't feel like wisdom. You know, sometimes my body will just say, Robert, you're allowed to lie on the couch tonight. Well, I lie on the couch. But listen for that voice. And when it's that negative ego voice going, you don't really need to go tonight, you're tired, I go. And I override, to me, the biggest thing is not letting that stinking thinking, the ego, recognizing it's probably not a need to stay home. It's probably a defeated ego, right? It's probably that voice of the ego saying, no, you can lie on the couch. I do not lie on the couch on those nights. I go to the gym. So if I had to sum that up to people as I go, trust the action in your life, not the thoughts, right? Do the action. You're always going to feel better. And you know what? If you still have some negative thinking, you have a workout in. And that's my example is just working out. But I tried with a lot of things to go, Robert, you know, you've had trauma. You have an ego. Do a double check. And I really do. As a spiritual person, I say my spirit speaks or my ego speaks. And they have a different frequency. Right. And so which are you going to listen for and take advice absolutely, from? Absolutely. And in the last years that I've been listening to that part that wants me to self-actualize, my days are a lot better when I listen to that voice. And that's it. But we need to slow down to listen, right? And, and Biggest this, thing. Yeah. And, you know, like you've shared, so we need to learn to love ourselves take those small little daily habits, those little actions. Yeah. We need to become more mindful of the moment, that present moment that we're in. And we have to realize that those thoughts are just thoughts, but it's really the action steps that we take. Those are the things that are gonna help us with those habits as we start to move forward. It's funny, I do a lot of habits when it comes to dating. You know, I've worked a lot with divorce and couples and uh, people have asked me a lot lately, like, well, how do I not attract the same person? And it's really interesting, as I said, most of the time, if you've had some crappy partners, you believe their status on the dating app and you believe them when they tell you that they do things and they go, well, yeah, I guess so. And I go, don't listen to what they tell you they do. Watch what they do. Right. All of us have a wish list. Of course, you're going to put up like that. I hike four miles every second day and I love reading. Well, you know what? If you scratch your butt and you're watching Netflix, say you scratch your butt and watch Netflix. <laughs> but most people are not doing that. Right. So the thing is, is that I say to people, watch your own actions and watch others because we, our actions tell us like we might desire to go to the gym. I say to people, I talked about the gym for years. It didn't change my health. <laughs> the action of the gym changed my health. 
move past the theory into action. Yeah, and I think with that too, it's also people often use the word, I can't, I'm not motivated to do it. And I think that's the difference. It's motivation versus discipline. And that's Absolutely. what action is. You know, I was Absolutely. listening to some of the, the Stoics today, you know, Marcus Aurelius. Yes. What it's about, right, is that we have to act because without it, nothing is getting done. Screw uh, motivation. I almost never have it. You know when I have it is when I'm half through halfway through my workout and I'm like, this feeling was not present when I was going to sit on the couch. This was not present when the ego was speaking. But look at the size of my biceps tonight. That's in action, right? That's in discipline. And then we reap those rewards and we're because you're listening again to the body, what the body needs, those signals of the body. Absolutely. Oh, this is great, Robert. I know we could talk forever, but yeah, I, thank really you, I thank you so much for your time tonight. And if people wanted to reach out to you, are you accepting any patients at the moment or? Probably not for a couple of years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very blessed. I'm very busy. Uh, you know, I wish I could clone myself. Um, after COVID, you know, people started realizing that we have to, you know, reach out for help. Um, and so, you know, I have enough existing clients through the years that, you know, some do maintenance, some come regularly, some come so many times a year. So, uh, you know what, uh, I'm not. And uh, part of my self-care is not accepting new clients. I, I needed a little change earlier in the year. So I accepted a couple of people just to shake things up. And it was wonderful just adding a few new voices. Um, but no, it probably be a couple of years, but we have some amazing new clinicians. We have some new places that have opened up with this demand. We have some great young clinicians that are really excited. Some people who are doing virtual, you know, if people find it a little bit easier to do things this way. Um, so there are lots of options out there for people. I can finally say that and refer people to other people. Well, it's wonderful. Well, thanks for all the work that you're doing. And again, as you work with others, you are shining their light. And this is how, again, we're going to really contribute to kind of bringing, just like we started with, we spoke talking about Trump, but bringing more peace and love kind of to our region. And then ultimately through, it's through the people that we touch, right? We have a web Absolutely. and we're shining that light. And, yeah. the people and that's that stronger than any negativity. Yes. Yeah. So if we can leave everyone with that, to know that there is a light out there, we are all connected as well yes. through this light. So sending, sending you lots of love, Robert. Thank you yes, so much. Yes, you tonight. too, Dr. Keenan. My pleasure. Thanks for always asking me. It's an honor. Take care. Bye now.